Good day. Today we're going to talk about diatonic harmony. And part of this is reason I bring this up is because I see people posting charts and fingering diagrams for piano for every chord imaginable in the universe. And you really don't need to know them. You just need to know your major key and um, know how they're all related and be able to transpose on the fly. Um, now that might be a hard thing, but this is how I see music. Um, there is a major scale, there is a minor scale, all the other spellings of them, no matter what key, they're all related because they all have the same conceptual framework. All right, and I'm gonna stick to major keys um, because minor keys have a, as we talk about them in Western Harmony, have a bit of a quirk to them that I'm gonna make a separate video for that. So here we go. So when I say diatonic, what do I mean? It means in the key of. Okay, now Western Harmony for about the last mm, four, five hundred years, um, we like to revolve around a tonic or a central pitch. Okay, so when we say a piece is in the key of D, uh, generally we try to begin and end on D. Um, when a key is in key of F, we try to begin and end on F. All right. Now, of course, composers love to play with keys and they modulate and they change keys and they come around and some, you know, in the 20th century, they'll say it's in the key of, you know, C and good luck finding that key of C. But, it, but that's a later development. And this is, a, uh, what do you call it? Sort of an introduction to diatonic harmony. Once you know the rules, I can show you how to break them. Okay. So, uh, as most of you know, there are 12 major keys, as you usually see in your circle of fifths. Um, now, in your uh, key, each pitch kind of has a function, and each triad built upon those pitches um, has a function too. All right. When I say triad, I mean three. Tri means three. So. I'm going to build a triad on the key of C. I'm going to go up a third to E. I'm going to go up another third to, to G. So C, E, G is a C triad. If I go key, uh, if I say F, an F triad has a third stacked on top of it, so it's F, A, C. That's an F triad. I'm going to illustrate that here in a second. Um, you also have extended harmony, sevenths, ninths, elevenths, thirteens, flat fives, and all sorts of other things that are built upon these triads, but generally they function, they retain their function. Of course, later on, yes, there's exceptions where we can swap cards in and out and they function as differently, but for the purposes of our discussion today, we are staying in, uh, trying to stay in one key. And what are those functions? We're going to get to that later, too. So a triad is three-note harmony. Okay? So a major triad has a root, a major third, and a perfect fifth. So the root is whatever I name the chord. So down here, I have a C major chord. All right? I can also have an F major chord chord. I can have a D major chord. I could have an E flat major chord. All right. So when I'm saying that, when we name the notes of the chord, when we name it, it's the, the, the root note. Okay. So if I say a G major chord, I'm going to be talking about a major chord built on G. If I say, um, a major chord, I'm talking about a major triad built on A. Okay, same goes for a minor chord. If I say B minor, I'm going to build a B minor chord on B. Or if I say a uh, F sharp diminished, I'm going to have a diminished chord built on F sharp. All right, that's just some vocabulary for you. So what makes these different? Okay, there's a major uh, chord, which is a root, major third, and a perfect fifth, and those are native to the keys to the excuse me the chords one, four, and five in harmony. We're going to get to that in a second. Hold your horses. 
We have minor chords, which has a root, a minor third, and a perfect fifth. And those are native to two, three, and six chords. And then the very special diminished chord, which is a root, a minor third, and a diminished fifth above a root for your um, diminished chord, which is your seventh chord. So let's go over here to... All right. So what are thirds? So I'm going to go from C. I'm going to go up to three. So one, two... Three. If I go up C, one, two, three, four, five, five. Okay. In the key of C, there's no sharps or flats, so this is a diatonic one chord because it is a chord built on the first scale degree. Okay, I want to build one on the second scale degree, so I'm going to go up one, two. There's a third, four, five, three chord, one, two, three, four, five, four chord, one, two, three, four, five, five chord, one, two, three, four, five, Six chord, one, two, three, four, five, seven chord, one, two, three, four, five, and back to one, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, now these are diatonic chords. So you notice I don't need to add any flats or sharps or anything because these are only using white keys. They are in the key of C. There are no black keys. They don't exist in this key. So these are all the diatonic chords that exist in C. All right. And I've got them labeled here with Roman numerals. Okay. So the first one is a one. The second one is a two chord. And because it's minor, we use lowercase. Third chord is a minor chord. So it gets a um, small Roman numeral, three. F is a major chord. So the four is a major chord. And it uses large Roman numerals because it is major. Same goes here. If I have a um, five chord, okay, it gets a big V, Roman numeral five, because it is major. Six gets a small uh, Roman numerals because it is minor and seven is a small Roman numeral and because it's like kind of super minor we call it diminished it has this um, where's my pointer here uh, it has this little circle by it that means it's diminished it's like super minor and I have um, stacked my thirds on top and if I go through all the math you will find that this is a minor third and a diminished fifth. Okay. Now, you only need to know one key and be able to transpose between it because the pattern will always be the same. Your one, four, and five are always major in your diatonic chords. Your two, three, and six are always minor. The seventh is always diminished. Okay. So that's only using the notes in that key. Okay, I'm going to show you again. Here, let's use the key of G. Okay, let's just stack thirds. Okay, I'm going to stack thirds. And because I have this F sharp here, that makes it the perfect fifth. So if I analyze these and I sit down and I break them all down, I will still find my same um, happy little pattern of major one, minor two, minor three, um, 
major four, major five, minor six, diminished seventh, major one. There it is in B flat. Same thing, stack thirds. All right. Same pattern, major one, minor two, minor three, major four, major five, major uh, minor six, uh, diminished seventh, and major one. In the wonderful key of F sharp, the rules are still the same, okay? Because the key signature has fixed everything. I don't need to write in anything. There you go. So let's take this all the way back to measure one. And here we go. So you can hear the pattern. Okay, so those are your basic chords. Now you saw the thing at the bottom, which is what we're going to get to next. So here we go. Okay, so those are your triads in, you know, a couple keys. The, the concept is the same. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, minor, uh, so major, minor, minor, major, major, minor, diminished, and come back to the one, major. All right. So, why do we do this? They have functions. All right? So, the functions of the chords, where do they go? Where do they want to do? Um, now, I made a video a while back about um, the names of the notes, so tonic, supertonic, median, uh, subdominant, dominant. Each note, note in the scale kind of has a function, and if you study music a lot, you kind of see where they want to go in relation to the tonic. The same thing goes for the chords that are built on them. All right. So one is home. It is stable. You could spend all day on your one chord and not go anywhere and you would be fine. It might be a boring piece, but it's home. All right. The next chord we'll talk about is the five chord. Okay. Its function is work. You go to work, you go stay at home, go to work, home, home, work, home, work, home, work. Always coming back to home. Five likes to go to one. All right. Four is the store. Is your grocery store or your shopping or whatever. All right. Um, you can go from home to the store. You can go from the store to work. You can go from the work to the store, especially if you're blues. Um, the store is kind of neither here nor there, but it likes to, uh, you know, it, it can go to one, uh, but you know, like you might go to the store before you go to work, or you might go to, to the store after work and then you come home. All right. Uh, two usually likes to come before five. So you get up early in the morning, you go to McDonald's, get your, uh, breakfast McMuffin or whatever, and then you go to work and then you come home. Six is, so, like, I went to work, and then I went to a friend's house to play video games or watch a movie. Um, okay, you can go there um, for a while, and then you might want to come home later, okay? Um, three is rarely used. 
Well, I mean, let me rephrase that. Three, um, it's kind of hard to find, like in Bach and uh, Mozart stuff, because the median chord, it's so close in relation because only one note change from the your tonic chord um, tends to sort of be kind of confusing um, harmonically. Yes, you can find examples of it. Um, rock and roll, uh, we can use a, 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 a three chord inverted um, as a substitute for a five, but I call it your three chord, your side job, you, you rarely do. Like, you know, your, your friend calls you to come and help him paint the house. Yeah, you, you don't, you do it, but you don't do it very often. And seven is your crazy neighbor is outside and they're waving their rake in the air and they're screaming at things that aren't there and uh, you wanna go inside, okay? Seven, 95% of the time goes to one. Can you find exceptions? Yes, okay? But as your general rule, this is the way we like to go, okay? So, what is, how do we use them? And when we use them, we call it a progression. And when I was taking music theory, I had the, I called it the locker combination, and I've written up there 36, 42, 57, 1, okay? The closer you get to 1, the more imperative it is you actually get to 1. Seven almost always goes to one. Five doesn't always have to. Five can go go to other things, but it usually likes to go to one. Two likes to go before five. Four likes to go before five. Two is usually uh, can be between four and five. Again, there is exceptions. Six, um, you know, like I had up here. Uh, let me click this. You know, is your home away from home? Uh, and if I like go to five to six, that's called a deceptive cadence. Five to one is not is a perfect cadence. Um, and cadences are like your resting points. Um, and uh, three is at the very beginning of it because you don't use it very often. Okay, I'm not saying there's not exceptions, but if we just don't tend to use it. Um, and there's many combinations of progressions depending on your style, okay? Um, if I am writing a Bach chorale, you know, um, I'll probably use most of those in my, my voice leading um, at some point. Um, but if I'm writing more progressive rock or, or uh, jazz or stuff, you know, the rules tend to... Tend to sort of go out the window. Um, an example of one that, that, that breaks, quote unquote, the classical rules, your blues progression, which has what we call a retrograde, has a 5-4-1. Um, and it's just the way it is, okay? Um, also, progressions are a good way to get started um, if you're sketching. Sort of like, let's start with a progression that I'm going to try to stick with just to get the ideas out of my head um, and see what happens. All right. So I, and also your progressions is kind of like the secret sauce of com composing because that's why a lot of shh, pop music sounds the same because they use the same progressions over and over. Don't tell anybody. All right. So what does a progression sound like? And let me go over here. Here we go. Is just some basic progressions here. One, four, five, one, one, four, five, one, four, two, five, one, one, six, two, five, one, one, seven, one, one. So here we go. Seventeen. Okay. So you know, you may have heard something like that in your playing or you're listening um, to music. 
Um, now, of course, we can change the duration. We can make one longer, one shorter, all this other stuff. But when we're analyzing it, that's how we analyze it. Put the, the um, chord symbol beneath it. A, um, now, let me do text. Okay, so another way that we talk about it in modern times is using chord symbols. Okay, so I didn't, don't say um, one, I can say C. I don't say four, I say F. I don't say five, I say G. And over here, I would say C. Okay, now functionally, these are the same but this is how we read it in, you know, modern music. Um, your old keyboard um, players in 17th century, they would see the chord symbols and they would automatically know what to play. Okay, so your jazz piano player, they see this on the top, they know what to play. Your uh, 18th century uh, harpsichordist, um, rocking out to, uh, you know, Bach or whatever, would um, see these symbols, equate them with the key signature, and they would just know what to do. All right. Okay, now, this one sounds clunky. Okay, let's listen to it again. Okay, so this one sounds kind of clunky because we don't write this way, all right? This is like, you know, Mountain Loud, maybe you could get away with this one. But the, having your hand on the, the keyboard move up and down in block motion is just not something we do. So what we did is we created these things called inversions, all right? So... Um, like I said, it avoids clunkiness with sort of upside down chords. Um, the first one here I put is like a math set um, theory. So if I have the numbers 1, 3, and 5, 3, 5, and 1, and 5, 3, and 1, they're considered the same. All right? Doesn't matter. If I open the box, I will still find a 1, a 3, and a 5. Doesn't matter what order I put them in. They are still the same. All right? So... How does this apply to music? I can have C E G E G C C R G C E. All right, or do mi do mi so mi so do so do mi. Okay, no matter how I put those together, it is still a C chord. All right. So um, at the bottom here, I have what would be officially called a one five three that tells the the keyboard player there is a f diatonic fifth and a diatonic third above the root note all right um and for shorthand they didn't need to always be told what to do so they would just write one okay so if you saw a plain old one you would just know okay that's a five there's a there's a uh, perfect fifth and a third that I need to comp over that bass note, okay? Modern notation has the letter C, okay? So we just know it's a C chord, okay? The next one is a one, six, three, or a one, six. Okay, so if I count um, my intervals from the bottom, okay? I see a diatonic six, so I'm gonna go up from E. So E is one, F is two, G is three, A is four, B is five, C is six. So it's going to be a six, a diatonic six and a third. So the six is going to be C, a diatonic third is E is one, F is two, G is three, okay? Again, it can be abbreviated as one six because your keyboard players understood that they that that note um, 
would be implied by the harmony. Modern notations on top where we have C slash E. Okay, so it's a C chord with E in the bass. And the last one here on the right is a 164 chord. Okay, so I'm in the key of C. I still need C, E, and G, but G is in the bass. All right, so what's the 6 4 about? So I need a diatonic sixth and a diatonic fourth above the bottom note. So I have a G, let's count. So G is one, A is two, B is three, C is your four, okay? D is your five, E is your six, okay? So your keyboard player 300 or 400 years ago would see one, six, four, they would just know those are the harmonies that would be played over that bass note, okay? Generally your bass note would be might be doubled in the left hand of the keyboard or your cello or bassoon or whatever bass instrument was playing. Okay, your modern notation is a C slash G. So I want a C chord, but I want the G, the fifth um, of the triad in the bass. Okay, so let's just go again. On the bottom is your old school um, figured bass. Um, that would have been used, uh, you know, 17, um, 1800s, okay? Not so much in the 1800s, but 17, 16, 1700s. And once Mozart and composers started fleshing out all the parts, they, they got away from it. Um, and then the top. And then the top is your... Um, modern notation if you are a keyboard player. So let's go back. So this first one is clunky. And I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do that one. I'm gonna do one that's less less clunky. Okay, so the first one has all this root motion. That's what we would call it. Okay, now it's actually, if I was a um, bass player, that's fine. But for voice leading, for everybody else, we try to keep it a little bit smoother and it also makes life easier because you don't need to move so many notes around. So if I'm going to write this, Okay, I would say C, and I would say F over C, and I would say G over B, and this last one would be C. And let me move my things around so I'm not getting in everybody's way. Okay, same here. Okay, I have a C chord. I have an F over C. And I have a D minor. And then a G over D. Excuse me. And then I have a C chord. Fix that up. Hey, I'm not using the chord uh, creator on here because I don't want to have to listen to it right now. But if I was using modern notation, that's what this would look like. Let's go to the next one. Um, there we go. Start with my C. Start with a a minor over C when I have the same D minor G over D and then a C and move these around like that so that 
that's there. And then this one would be a C. Then B dim, or I could write E that over D, and then I could do uh, C over E. Okay, so that's how you notate your chords and inversions in both Roman numerals and modern symbols. And before I go on here, okay, the, the inversion is always determined by the lowest note, okay? So this is a one chord. This is also a one chord. If I take this C, okay, and drop it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like that, it is still a one chord. Same goes for here, okay? One six, this is a kind of a closed position. This is an open position. If I drive this one down, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like that. Actually, that's, that's the C. Okay, if I do it like that, I know that looks horrible. This would be in the bass clef. It is still a first inversion, okay? You know, the lowest note tells you what your inversion is. And for those of you who are very new to theory, do not, you have to look at all the notes. Don't just look at the bass note because the number of times I've seen people, they'll see a first inversion C chord and they'll say, oh, well, C E is in the bass. It must be a three. No, look above because there's a C up there or and a G. So look at all the notes. Don't just assume that because G is in the bass that it's a five chord. Look at all the notes because it could be a one, six, four. All right. I hope you found this helpful. Um, if you think I could be of help to you, the studio is open. I offer a, a six month and one year sort of subscription uh, service where I can help you one-to-one, -one, one hour a week, and um, help you create um, original music so you're going to be creating and doing the theory at the same time. Um, I find it, uh, theory is the way we discuss the music, um, but um, my program gets you writing from day one, and then we learn how to describe it. Um, if you think that that's something you'd like to do, the, studio, the link is in the description. Contact me on the Calendly link. Um, I also offer saxophone lessons if you are interested in saxophone. Um, so have a nice day, and if you have any questions, let me know. Bye.